Good afternoon, this is John Jordy. I'm with All About Chippewa Valley, and I'm at the Chippewa Valley Museum in Eau Claire in the lovely Carson Park, which is a, a, a gem in this community. And I have the pleasure, honor of uh, uh, meeting today and having a conversation with Brian Blakely. Uh, he is here with his lovely wife in the background, and, and the thing I have to note is they just recently celebrated their 60th wedding anniversary. So congratulations, Brian and Mary. Thank you. She put up with me for a long, long time. <laughs> well, it takes two to make things work. So congratulations to both of you. Uh, Brian Blakely uh, is a local historian. He has been a professor uh, for a number of years and I uh, grew up um, in the Chippewa, the Eau Claire area. Uh, and him and his wife both, you know, have uh, close roots to family that own property in the area. Some people might be familiar with Blakely or Bryan Street in Eau Claire, but uh, his name is on both of them. Brian has put a lot of work into uh, three volumes of books on the history of Eau Claire. And can you tell us why you decided to write these books? It's a very good question. And perhaps the best explanation is I needed some project, some way to... Uh, uh, spend my time. As you mentioned, uh, I taught uh, at the university, um, primarily at Texas Tech for a better part of 30 years. And uh, uh, after we moved to uh, uh, this area in uh, 1998, uh, we spent most of our time uh, developing our timber farm, which is located north of Menominee. But uh, as uh, time passed and uh, we aged, I needed something else to do. So I returned to writing. And uh, I was trained as a British imperial historian, writing books on things like the 19th century colonial office. But uh, I decided that uh, given the library facilities in uh, the Wheeler, Wisconsin area, uh, it would be better for me to look at something more, more local. And so I decided that uh, I would pursue the writing of a history of Eau Claire uh, because there hasn't been a really comprehensive study of Eau Claire, at least since the 1960s when Lois Barlin wrote two volumes on the city. But uh, I tried to take a kind of more general approach and relate uh, uh, the history of Eau Claire to the history of, of uh, Wisconsin and the nation in general. And uh, so that's what led me to this uh, project. And, and, you know, I know writing books, especially history books, takes a lot of uh, research. Um, what have you learned in your research about the history of Eau Claire? Well, I think that the primary thing I learned was that uh, Eau Claire, despite its uh, relative remote location, always been an important city in uh, Wisconsin. As early as the 1880s, it was the second largest city in the state. And uh, it has survived, it has changed, shown a vibrancy that other cities such as uh, O Superior, Ashland, maybe even La Crosse, although La Crosse would probably resent that, <laughs> um, have, have lacked. And I think uh, it retained a vibrancy because Eau Claire would always, uh, in a way, reinvent itself, John. Uh, it started out primarily as an exploiter of natural resources. Uh, lumbering. Uh, it then uh, moved uh, uh, rather quickly uh, into an era dominated by uh, manufacturing. Uh, this was particularly true of the 1920s, 30s, and World War II. And then more recently, in the post-World War II period, uh, it has uh, diversified and become essentially uh, an area that provides many services, uh, medical, educational, governmental, and so on. So 
Eau Claire has always reinvented itself, and that, I think, explains its vibrancy and why uh, so many people uh, are attracted to the city uh, uh, today. Yeah, and, and it's interesting you mentioned how they were taking advantage of the natural resources. I think people in today's world, even though it's much more modern and diverse and we're dealing with an economic scale that you know people back then never could conceive, but still, I think people love this area because of those natural resources, mm -hmm. the parks, the, the, the rivers, the lakes. Um, just it's a great place to be outdoors, biking, hiking, um, snowshoeing, it, it, you know, wildlife. Oh, yes. And, and uh, so it's, it is kind of interesting how that the natural resources still plays a huge, huge role in people's quality of life here. Yes. So, so tell me in your research as well, who are the influencers over the years in the history of Eau Claire? These three different Eau Claire's, and of course the city always encompasses aspects of all three of these types of activities. Um, it's just a matter of emphasis. But in the early period, the lumbering period, I'd have to give my uh, uh, nod to uh, Orrin Ingram, who was uh, the principal lumberer uh, in the uh, uh, 1880s and 1890s. Shaw is more famous, but Ingram was more significant by far because he works out uh, an arrangement uh, uh, to share the lumbering uh, resources of the valley. And then later, he's one of the first who realizes that lumbering is about to end in the area. And so he's primarily uh, responsible for getting people to realize they're going to have to shift their economic approach. Uh, and so he's important not only to lumbering uh, his empire lumbering company, but he's also important in the transition to that second uh, area. Uh, I don't think he's often given the credit that he deserves because there is no big, well-known Ingram Park. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a Carson mm -hmm. Park named after someone far less significant than Ingram. Um, but uh, he, he would be the man I'd choose there. In the uh, second period, uh, the period of manufacturing, I would uh, define it uh, uh, more broadly. Uh, manufacturing or uh, a change in economic activity can take all sorts of uh, approaches. And so I would uh, put in uh, my primacy there uh, one person who's almost never even mentioned, uh, and that's a man by the name of Emmett Horum. Uh, he uh, was a, a prominent businessman uh, in the city. And uh, primarily, he's important because in the early 20th century, when lumbering is declining, he was appointed to the Board of Regents of the state uh, colleges, or the normal schools, as they were called at that point. And uh, this was despite the fact that there wasn't even a normal school in Eau Claire at that, at that time. And it's uh, Horam who... Uh, uh, is the man who uh, really gets Eau Claire the last of the normal schools established in the state. Hmm. And that was quite a fight that he uh, put in because uh, uh, there were already normal schools in the area, River Falls, uh, the one in Menominee, Stout, uh, Superior, uh, even Stevens Point. Uh, so he had to fight very hard to get it, but uh, it's established in 1916, and it becomes, uh, one could almost argue, you know, the principal industry uh, of the changing Eau Claire. Mm -hmm. The other person is probably better known, and that's uh, Christian Middlefort, uh, who establishes the clinic here, 
And because he was such a dominant uh, surgeon, he is also the chief surgeon at uh, uh, the new Luther Hospital of that period. Mm -hmm. And uh, he does a great deal to uh, uh, um, make medicine an industry. And then in the final phase, where you really get a diversified economy, I'd have to put John Menard in there. Mm -hmm. uh, not only because uh, uh, he builds uh, uh, an empire of uh, home improvement materials and so on, but he's the one who, uh, in a way, shifts uh, much of the orientation of Eau Claire to the north, the northwest part of the city, whereas everyone thought it would uh, continue to go south. But he's the one who really creates uh, uh, the new industrial park in North uh, Eau Claire, sure. where Hutchison is located. Mm -hmm. So those are the people I would uh, see as primarily important, uh, only in an economic sense, though. So. Sure. Well, and I think that when you consider the, the evolution in the different eras of Eau Claire, we've just kind of seen a compilation and growth in that blue collar manufacturing sector and it being where located where it is becoming a regional hub for medicine for mm -hmm. shopping for entertainment and and so i think that that its location resources industry and how it's evolved um, has just grown this whole area and to make it just a wonderful place to be and mm -hmm. uh, i i i uh, just want to remind the people listening that if they want to learn more about your insights and stories of the different eras in Eau Claire, there's three different volumes that they can pick up either at the local store, which is downtown Eau Claire, or at the Chippewa Valley Museum. Thanks for your time, Brian. It's been a pleasure. It's been a lot of fun, John. Yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you.